If you're an avid Apple fan like me, then Apple Home is a great way of controlling your smart home devices. However, it doesn't support every smart home device. In fact, most smart home devices don't work with Google Home, Apple Home, and Alexa all at the same time. You have to pick the devices that are right for your hub technology. In today's video, we're gonna see how we can work around this and add support for a much wider range of devices to Apple Home. Let's take a quick look at my Apple Home setup so I can give you a sense of what devices you can add. So here we are in Apple Home, and I've got these four lights here, which are Philip Hue lights. They're supported by default in the home setup. This living room light here is a Wemo socket. That's not supported by default though. These two TVs, I had to add support for those myself. The same with this motion sensor here, the same with these cameras down here. In fact, I think about 60, maybe 70% of the devices I control in Apple Home are not supported out of the box. I've had to add support for them myself. And I've done this by pairing the wonderful HomeBridge software with a Raspberry Pi as the little home server, as a little HomeBridge server that I use to extend what devices I can run. And today we're gonna to find out how that works. So HomeBridge is free open source software that acts as kind of a bridge between third party devices and the Apple Home Hub. You can run HomeBridge on pretty much any computer, but because it's got pretty modest hardware requirements, it's actually quite common to run it on a Raspberry Pi. In general, the setup looks something like this. You have some kind of Apple Home Hub device, so an Apple TV, a HomePod, or an iPad, or something, and you have something like a Raspberry Pi running the HomeBridge software. I've run HomeBridge on both the Pi 3 and the Pi 4, but if you're planning to run plugins for your security cameras, then I strongly suggest going with the Pi 4 for the much improved performance. Then you have your Apple Home client devices like your iPhone, that these talk with the Apple Home Hub, and your third-party devices talk with the HomeBridge, and then the HomeBridge and the Apple Home Hub talk to each other. And essentially here, the HomeBridge is acting like a proxy to the technically unsupported devices. If Apple Home is your choice of home automation platform, then investing the $50 and two or three hours it takes to set up HomeBridge, to me, is a no-brainer. You will vastly increase the set of devices you can use. You're no longer constrained by the uh, Apple-blessed devices. This means you can be a little bit savvier when you're shopping. You can spend less money. I always buy the cheapest smart plug that's available on Amazon whenever I need one, as long as it's supported by HomeBridge. And I also was able to get way more out of devices I already had in my house, like my Samsung TV and my LG TV. So you've heard me talk a lot about the different devices that I'm using at home, like the Samsung TV and the LG TV. HomeBridge itself doesn't know how to talk to these particular devices. Instead, there are hundreds of free plugins available on the internet that provide support for a huge array of devices. You can search these for free before you even try to install HomeBridge so you can check that your devices are supported. Every extra device that I have in my Apple Home is there thanks to a plugin that's been created for HomeBridge. If you're a coder and you know enough about JavaScript and the Node.js platform, then you can build your own plugins. But for the most part, you'll be running HomeBridge with a bunch of existing plugins specific to your setup and your devices that are in your house. So you can, of course, install HomeBridge yourself on any computer you've got. And if you're familiar with the command line and familiar with Node.js, then that's absolutely th something you can, you can pursue. However, I think it's a lot easier just to install using a solution called Hoobs, which stands for HomeBridge out of the box. With Hoobs, you have three choices. You can buy a full hardware and software package like this here. You can buy a pre-flashed SD card that you can then just run in your Raspberry Pi, or you can download the SD card image and flash it yourself. I went with the third option here and burned my own SD card, and the installation process is pretty simple. If you stick around to the end of the video though, I will run you through that whole process, but I'll also run you through the tweaks I made to improve the responsiveness of my own HomeBridge setup. For now though, let's dive in and see how HomeBridge actually works after installation. In addition to the HomeBridge software, Hoobs provides access to this HomeBridge config UI. So once you've installed Hoobs, you can go to hoobs.local in your browser, type in admin as the username and admin as the password, and then you're into the kind of console here. After you log into HomeBridge, you'll see the main status page and it's really quite simple. We can see the CPU and memory statistics of whatever machine you're running on. This is my Raspberry Pi. Is HomeBridge running? Are you up to date? Have you got any outdate plugins? You can see a brief view of the logs here. This is important. This is the QR code that you have to scan inside the Apple Home app. And once you do that, then HomeBridge and all of the devices attached to the HomeBridge are accessible. And you'll see the HomeBridge itself inside the hubs and bridges section of the Home app. In the plugins section, you can see which, what plugins you've got installed. You can search for new ones. We're gonna come back to that in a second. And I've taken a few out so that we can install them later in the video. You can see the raw configuration details in the config tab. Now, 
when you're editing some plugin configuration, you'll see we're creating this in the GUI, but sometimes you do need to dive into here and type some of these things in yourself. Really easy to do, and we'll see how that works in a second. And then at the end here, you can see a list of all the accessories you've got installed in your home bridge. You probably won't use this page much because you'll be driving all your automation through the Apple Home app, but it is nice to get a sense for what HomeBridge thinks your world looks like in case you think there's something missing from the Apple Home app. Couple of other things of note here. If you wanna see the logs in great detail, click on the view logs button at the top here and you can see everything that's been going on. Press the restart button to restart HomeBridge. You'll be doing that quite a bit. Every time you make a config change, you need to restart the HomeBridge and it can pick up the changes. And then under the little uh, three dots icon here, you've got a few useful things. You can bring up a terminal window in case you need to do any manual edits on the server itself. You can shut the server down completely. You can add new user accounts and you can log out. For the most part though, these four tabs are everything that you need. So let's actually start to think about installing some plugins and I want to reconfigure my LG TV. So I'm just gonna do a search for LG here. And you can see a whole bunch of plugins pop up. And if you're trying to pick one, it can be useful to look at the release date. So this one was released on the 17th of December, 2019. So very recent. And you know, this one's quite recent as well. I happen to know that this is the one I've been using, but you can see there's already quite a lot of support here for LG devices. So I'm gonna click install to bring this one into the home bridge. And this is a modern style Homebridge plugin, which means you don't actually have to configure it manually. You can configure it through this nice GUI. And this is a nice thing of combining Homebridge with the Homebridge config UI, which you get out of the box with Hoobs. So I'll just fill these in with my details now. Scroll to the bottom and click save. So that's the LG TV configured. If we go to the logs, you'll see that um, the config has been changed, but nothing's happened yet. We have to restart the home bridge. So I'll click the restart button. While this is restarting, just I wanna make a really important point. This is a plugin that's controlling the device completely on your local network. There's no cloud service involved. So if you're quite security conscious, then one of the benefits of the way Apple Home tends to work, and in particular the way Homebridge works, is there's a real bias towards local control of your devices, controlling your devices completely through your local network. So Homebridge is now restarted. If we come into accessories and we scroll down, we can now see that the LG TV buttons are here. I've got a volume control channel up and down and a sequence number and a, and a TV on and off button. I can tweak these buttons to my liking in my config. And I actually have a config I've, I've polished up over the last few weeks for this TV. So uh, I'm gonna switch that out after. But let's go back and take a look at another plugin, one that you have to configure completely by hand. So one of the things I noticed that's missing from this is my TP-Link smart plugs. And I tend to buy these plugs if they're on sale on Amazon. So I'll do a search for TP-Link. And there's two plugins here. And I know this one works because I've used it before. Updated in February of uh, 2019. I want to make one point at this, uh, at this juncture that's really important. If we go to the Hoobs website and we scroll all the way to the bottom, what you'll see is that there's a roadmap for plugins to get certified. So these plugins here are already certified and supported by Hoobs. And this is the list of plugins that's being worked on right now that are going to eventually become a standard part of Hoobs. And you can see that the Homebridge TP-Link Smart Home plugin is eventually just gonna become the Hoobs TP-Link plugin. So this is definitely the plugin that is kind of the future for TP-Link on Homebridge. And I say this because I want you to make sure you check this list whenever you're looking for plugins and you can find out more information about upcoming certified plugins from this link down here. But let's get back to this. I'm gonna install this. Okay, cool. So notice that we didn't get a pop-up here. There was no pop-up saying like, what plugs do you want support or anything like that, like we got with the LG TV. This is an entirely self-configured plugin. Do not be intimidated by this though. Really easy to find out what to do. If you click on the link here for the help, it brings up the page for this plugin and you can scroll down and typically you'll find some sort of typical configuration. So this is the minimal configuration you need to get this working. And if you scroll down a little bit further, it tells you a bit more about the kinds of things that you need to add. And in particular, this is the one I wanna change. I don't have either of these switches and these are the default, so I need to configure my switch. So if we go back into here, go into the config, I'm going to add it in. Before we do that though, I want to just point out the two main areas of the config file. There's an accessories section. And then if we scroll down, there is a platforms section. So the accessory section is typically used when you're configuring a very 
particular instance of a device like an air conditioner or a television. Whereas the platforms section is often used when you're configuring a general technology like all the TP-Link smart plugs or all the Nest devices or all the security cameras I have that look like this. I'm not configuring device by device. Instead, I'm configuring a platform of supported devices. So I'll just pop this after my Wemo configuration. We can click save. We can reboot. So we've rebooted now, and if I scroll back through the log files, you'll see that the TP-Link smart home plugin is installed, but none of my devices have been detected. If I come to the accessories page here, I can see some devices that are switches, but none of these are my TP-Link device. And there is a reason for that, and I've left this in because I wanted to highlight this just in case anybody has a similar issue. If I come back to the config file and scroll down, you'll notice that in certain places I'm specifying devices manually. Um, like here, I'm specifying my IP address to my TV specifically, but I'm specifying these cameras specifically. And here I actually need to specify the devices exactly. And the reason for this is I have my IoT and smart home devices typically segmented into a different network. And because of that, some of these plugins cannot see them by default. So I'm trying to be really clear at this point, I don't know anything about these plugins. I didn't write any of these. I've barely read the code for them. Everything I'm showing you now, I've just found out by reading the documentation and reading the sample configuration files and just kind of playing around. So there's not any kind of special prior knowledge I have, other than maybe knowing that if the networks are segmented, you might need to explicitly define your devices. But now you know that as well. Back to it. So we are rebooted now. And if I come into accessories, yep, there's my office lamp and I can turn it off and I can turn it back on, which is great. Cool. So that's how you install plugins. Let me say the danger at this point is it's really easy to get carried away with trying to automate every device you have in your house. And I've just started taking a few things out of my configuration. It's completely pointless being able to automate a light that I hardly ever use, but go crazy in the early days, figure out how things work and you can play around with it. Let me just show you two more things about the config file though. So the first thing is don't worry about screwing up the config file. It's it's not a big deal if you mess things up. So let me maybe just go and change something down here. Like I'm going to misspell this Bravia platform to platform or something like that. And we'll click save. Now that's like a valid looking file, but that won't work. So I made that change and I've rebooted. And you can see here in the log files that there's something wrong. And what will happen now is if I bring up the full logs, you'll see that it just keeps spinning, waiting for us to try and correct the config file. It'll shut down, try to restart. And it obviously, because we're not fixed the file yet, things will just go wrong. Thankfully, there is a backup and restore option, so we can easily just restore our config file to how it was before. So I come here and click on restore, and then go copy to editor for the last version that we had. And if I scroll down, let me just check that's the right version. Yep, we've spelled the Bravia platform correctly here and click save. Now I can come to the log files and what will happen is it will pick everything up and away we go, we're fine. So yeah, those are the two things you need to know. You can mess up the config files, they're auto backed up and then you can restore them if things go wrong. Got a one final power tip. Up here in the three dots icon, you can ring up a terminal. If things go absolutely wrong, you can get in here and play around. One thing you might want to consider is if you're changing the config a lot and it won't restart, then that's quite common. Um, if you look here, there's an accessories directory. And if we look inside that accessories directory, there's a file called cached accessories. If you delete that file, especially after having removed a particular plugin, delete that file and restart, usually that fixes things. So that's the basics of Homebridge when installed via Hoobs and the basics of how you install plugins. Now I should say there are a few plugins that require quite a bit more work than this. In particular, the security cameras you saw at the beginning in the Apple Home app, those took a ton of time to get working in particular because they required specific software to be compiled for the Raspberry Pi with a very specific configuration. If that's something you're interested in, then throw a comment below. I'll happily do a video about that or maybe write a blog post or something. It's quite specialist, but if you're interested in security cameras in Apple Home, you'll probably find it quite useful. For now though, I promised we'd do an installation guide. So let's just switch back to the beginning of the process and see how you go about installing Hoobs and tuning your Homebridge instance to make it work faster on your network. If you saw my video about how to install a Raspberry Pi and are worried that Hoobs is as complicated as that, no need, it's a really simple process. Simply head over to the Hoobs website, scroll down to this section where it says, choose your way to go, go to the four experts section, not really much experts to be involved, download the SD card image, burn the SD card using your software of choice. I highly recommend Belina Etcher for both Windows and Mac. Once you've done that, you can simply just pop the SD card into your Raspberry Pi, start it up, and that's it. 
By default, then you can just go to hoops.local on your network, use admin, admin, username and password, and you are aware you've got a working Homebridge instance. To add this to Apple Home, as I mentioned before, simply scan the QR code in your Apple Home app and that will add the home bridge as a hub or bridge. You can verify that by checking the hub or bridge section. And then any accessories you add to home bridge, once you've restarted it, will appear inside the home app. That is the absolute standard basic hoops installation process complete, really simple. There aren't many tweaks you need to make, but there is one that I definitely recommend. If you find that the devices you've added to Apple Home via HomeBridge are not responding very quickly, they're quite laggy, that's not normal. They should be as fast as, or nearly as fast as, what you would get with a normally supported device. The reason you're seeing that lag is often because there's a conflict between the IPv6 configuration on your Raspberry Pi. Really simple to solve it. Let's see how. Okay, so to do this, I'm actually gonna do it from within HomeBridge itself. I'm gonna bring up a terminal up here, so you don't need any special software for this. So the first thing we need to do is tell the Raspberry Pi itself to stop using IPv6, really easy. We're gonna edit a file called uh, command line or cmd line.txt in the boot folder. And all we want to do is right at the end of this line, let's see if I can find my end key. You're going to add this section, ipv6.disable equals one. I've not had it quite at the end here, but you usually add it right at the end. And then save this file with control and O to write it out. And control and X will exit. And just notice that I ran that with the sudo prefix, which means do this command as the super user. Okay, next step, we're gonna tell a program called Avahi not to use IPv6. Avahi is the program that publishes friendly domain names on your local network. So that's why you can use hoops.local in your browser rather than the IP address of your Homebridge instance. Again, similar process as a super user using nano, go to the folder etc Avahi, and we want avahi-daemon.conf. And then, Scroll down to this section that's labeled server in these square brackets. And here I've just put a pound or a hash sign in front of the line that says use IPv6, which is kind of a comment character and says you can ignore this line. So this will no longer use IPv6. Write this out again, control O to write out and then control and X to exit. And then the third and final step is to tell Nginx, which is the web server used by the Homebridge configuration, not to use IPv6 as well. Again, similar process, sudo nano. This time the config file is etc nginx sites-enabled default. And we're going to come down here. I'm going to remove this line with the listen square brackets, colon, colon, blah, 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 blah. So that all that's left is that listen 80 line. And again, control O to write out, control X to exit. Now we just need to restart and that will be IPv6 completely stopped. One note. I mean restart the whole machine at this point rather than just Homebridge. And you can do that right from here with a sudo reboot. So as I think you'll have seen in this video, Homebridge really unlocks a whole array of extra devices that you can use with your Apple Home setup. And I think if you're serious about using Apple Home and about home automation, it really is worth the time investment and the money investment just to go and set something like this up. Now, I don't want you to be intimidated by the need to mess around with configuration files and things like that. It really is simple. I must reiterate, I knew nothing about any of the plugins I showed you prior to first trying them out. Yes, I've got a bit of coding experience, so the config file looks familiar to me, but really I know nothing about this system beyond that it's written in JavaScript. So I really enjoyed making this video, but the thing that really stuck with me is we've really only just scratched the surface of what you can do with Homebridge. There are so many supported devices, so many cool things you can do with automations. If you want to hear more about this topic and there are particular things you'd like to hear about, then please do comment below. This is a topic I'm really passionate about. So I'm very happy to make videos about it as long as it's something I know about and something I can help with. I hope that you found this video useful and I hope that you found it entertaining. If so, please hit like, please hit subscribe and don't just hit subscribe, but hit the bell as well so you don't miss out on any future content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.